thanks for coming out. I came just over after this. I know. We just finished, so. You just finished. Somebody in our chat's like, I pledged money. I, you just updated to say that uh, Wiz is in your new movie. Yeah, yeah. We just did an interview with Wiz Khalifa. He was great. Mm. Cool cat, really mellow, and, and super funny, too. Excellent. Um, well, welcome to Vapor Central. We're live on POT TV. Oh, awesome. We got camera up there, so just so you know. Um, we have vapor bags for you. We I'm also good, man. I'm good. Okay, excellent. We Thank also have a though. big bowl of hash, just in case. We <laughs> yeah, in case that wasn't enough, eh? <laughs> we have like a couple strains of weed. We have Kayla working a mic for you. Perfect. We kind of know what we're doing. That seems... Is, is, so is this a place that Joe always talks about that he comes to? Joe goes to Puff Mama's, which oh. is a couple blocks. He's never been to our place. Oh, he'd love this place. He would. So next time he's in town. I'll have to bug him next time about that. Because um, this is actually the heart of um, Youngsterdam. Uh, Vapor Central's been here for five years. We're a Bring Your Own Bud Cannabis Lounge. Six years, Bring Your Own Bud Marijuana Lounge. You can pay $5 at the door. We have volcano vaporizers everywhere. I've, I've noticed. Yeah, and uh, people just hang out. Um, What's the latest movie about that people have pledged two hundred and forty thousand dollars? <laughs> yeah, for, for those that don't know, uh, I mean, I, I did the first movie, The Union, The Business Behind Getting High, and we're doing a follow-up to it called The Culture High, and The Culture High is really an update of where the union left off with stats from two thousand six, what's happened since two thousand six, and then looking at the global cultural shift that's starting to happen in the way people are looking at cannabis laws. I mean, it's changed dramatically from when we did the film in two thousand six to now. So, and things are ever changing and ever, you know, there's always something every week I'm getting sent something new in the media. So we're looking much more at the global perspective and how the global war on drug has been fo forced onto other countries and stuff like that in order to get, um, you know, uh, foreign aid and stuff like that. So it's, it's been a fascinating ride. It's cool having the union under before because more people are jumping on board. We, you know, Snoop Dogg did an interview for this one, Wiz Khalifa, be real. Kevin Smith is going to be involved, and of course, Joe Rogan's coming back. Excellent, excellent, everybody. So now they know what's going on. My question is: is so, what to you is the culture of cannabis? I mean, we have prohibition, but obviously here in Vapor Central, we have a comedy night, we have musicians, we do the Myrna Wana Zone, my podcast, we do a, a Monday night podcast, a CK podcast. What role does the culture of cannabis play? Well, actually, it was funny because me and Wiz were talking about that just now is that, uh, I mean, the, 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 the cannabis culture is very similar. I, I kind of compare it to kind of like the gay movement culture, right, is that if you are, you know, it's a, a lot of it is about civil liberties and, and rights of people being able to use something that is a, you know, a victimless crime. So when you get on the good side of the cannabis culture, they're an army, just like the gay community is yep. for that support, right? Like, and it's been amazing to see, because our Kickstarter goal of 240 grand was the, that's the highest Canadian film and video project ever raised through crowdfunding to date. Someone will beat me, sure enough, and then it's the sixth highest of all time on Kickstarter, period. So the cannabis community is one that is really open arms when you're on their good side, and they are, uh, a dangerous army to go against. I was going to ask you that. Um, are cannabis people more prone to giving money for what they believe in? I think, I mean, definitely. There are, uh, that's why I compare it so much to that. It's, it, it's, if you look back at U.S. history and, and Canadian history even, like a lot of the most, a lot of the greatest laws that have been passed weren't done by the people on the top. They were done by the people forcing or wanting or demanding change. You look at like race separation in the United States, equal rights for men and women, interracial marriages, gay marriage, all that stuff was driven by the people first and then forced politicians to make change. And I think cannabis is something that falls right into that as well. It's something that is going to be pushed from the people up. It's not something that the people up above are going to make. When they realize that there's enough people behind it or wanting to see a change, then that's when the politicians are going to jump on it, which you're starting to see them come to the surface more and more now. Um, was Washington State and Colorado State a definite, like, sort of like a, a break in the dam? Definitely, because now you have two states. I mean, it's interesting if you follow history, because the Volstead Act, or the Prohibition of Alcohol, one of the first states to repeal the Volstead Act was Colorado, right? So the same things are falling, and when the states keep going, and then all the horror stories can't be fulfilled with what you've been told for years, what these states happen, and you know, use isn't up crazily and people aren't killing each other, then it's hard to sustain 
that kind of policy in other states and you'll just see more and more tear down. But you won't see the federal government back off. They're gonna try to, they're gonna push probably harder in the next five years because they have a financial interest to do so. Oh, the financial, you speak a lot in the union about the financial interest. I, I'm gonna, we show it here so often, I said to people if it was a VHS tape, we'd have to replace it about a dozen times. I mean, it is a great way to subliminally uh, get messages out, but I wanna go back to, to, I have a question about Washington State. Um, do you think on December 6th their liquor outlets are going to start openly selling weed to people? I don't and know. And will you be there filming it? Uh, I, I don't know. No, we're, I mean, we're trying to get all over the place. Right now, actually, my guys are really pushing for a break because we haven't had any kind of vacation in the last six months. Um, but uh, stuff like that, you know, we can always get through news archive footage and stuff like that if we miss it. So uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I think some places will probably do that in Washington, but... I mean, you just saw Washington had a whole bunch of dispensaries raided too, right? right. So they're going to push hard for the next little bit. I mean, from the law enforcement we've interviewed is the doors are – marijuana has always been the catalyst, right? When Nixon first declared the war on drugs in the 70s, when he first took it to Congress, the original thing was to help deal with people that were coming off of morphine addiction coming back from the Vietnam War. And originally the plan was to work more on treatment and less on incarceration. But when they went to Congress and only had, they estimated at that time, 100,000 people had addiction problems. That wasn't enough to get Congress interested. But marijuana use was way higher, right? So right. it's always the citadel for the argument. So then they were able to say, well, there's like a million people using marijuana on a regular basis. Now you had the numbers that would get Congress interested. So that was what really led. And then, of course, corruption goes all the way up to the top, so then it became le much less about helping people. It became much more about incarceration, and then the private prison complex and stuff came much later. Do you, uh, do you, is the war on drugs, especially, or we'll talk about the war on marijuana. Mm. Is this a, a war on a subculture? It, it definitely a war on different cultures because it's, it's more of an elitist versus different groups, right? I mean, you have our, the current president of the United States plus pretty much the last four that have been in power that have all openly confess to using marijuana at some point in their career, yet they lock people up for doing the very same thing. Well, so actually, it, it's no. that, that old elite, you know, where the elite are allowed to do it as long as, like, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Ex well, yeah, the elite as long as they don't get caught, right? And Obama was, just to be clear, Obama just didn't smoke pot. When it was going, the joint would go around the circle, he would intercept it. Well, like, yeah, that takes balls. He was a member of the Choom gang, right? Which yep. they, they coined the phrase. So, I mean, yeah, it's... It, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's, you're seeing the statistics are also showing that it's still very racist, right? That yep. you know, minorities are using the drug at the same level that, that Caucasians are, yet we are in the United States, and even in Canada or the UK, they're arresting at three to four times more per 100K, even though the drug use among the different uh, is still the same. One of the questions that came in, and, we're gonna, and we do take questions, you can just write them down and pass them up, and we'll sure. gladly. Uh, does the movie discuss BHO and dabbing? That's a great question. No, what I do, n I not currently. What is that? Oh, okay then. Oh shit, <laughs> people are running now. You don't. Uh, dabbing is uh, butane honey oil. It's it's butter. Uh. It's wax. It has gotten a lot of attention in the media lately. I did see the recent article about the wax saying that it's ninety four percent THC or something. Oh, uh, it, it's it's potent. They're gonna get. They're gonna dab me. I think, and I'll show you. It, it's like doing shots, essentially. It's, it's pretty potent. I mean, there might be bits of that, but it's, it's much bigger than talking about a specific. I mean, we're going to go into strains and different stuff like that, but it's much more about the culture is much more about policies okay. and political stuff and the global cultural situations going on. So but, I mean, we are definitely going to break down because it's still a very big misconception. A lot of people don't understand strains and different what CBD levels are and THC and what the crossbreeding and all that means. So you're just trying to like, especially because the movie is out for major release. Oh, geez. So I'm going to cough after this, but this is butter. Um, there you go. It was shattered, but it's been buttered up. It's been warmed in her bag. And so the, a lot of the younger people are into it. It's a, it's a great way of getting uh, medicated very quickly or very, very stoned very, very fast. In a short amount of time, there's a, a butter kit. It's made with butane. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I've, I've seen lots of the butters and different, okay. you know, edibles and cookables and stuff, but I didn't specifically know yeah. that one when you said that yeah. name. Yeah, this, so that's... With buttered with these. Buttered with these. Um, so I'm gonna, I did that question. Do you think marijuana docs ought to be neutral in their presentation or because of the propaganda, completely biased? No, I mean, that's exactly, that's a great question I ever put. That's... That's why, I mean, even from when we did the union to the culture high, we stay away from any of the stereotypical colors, designs, um, music that's often associated with marijuana culture to try to get people that wouldn't normally watch a marijuana doc to come watch one. And the union was successful at that being invited. It was the first cannabis doc to ever be invited to Parliament Hill by members of Parliament to help educate the leaders of this country on what's <laughs> going on with the subject matter. So... Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Congratulations. I mean, imagine a documentary that is played here frequently. All of it played on Parliament Hill. The first you play, it was in thirty film festivals. But what was the difference between playing it in film festivals and Parliament Hill? Well, Parliament Hill, when they asked us to come film there, I I thought I was getting pranked at first, right? Because <laughs> I had this email saying we'd like you to come to Parliament Hill and screen your movie and talk to senators and MPs. And I was like, so I wrote back to see if it'd even get a response, or maybe this was like a generic email that bounced into my email somehow. And they wrote me right back and said, no, no, we, we want you to come out here. And I, I was like, really? And then even then, I didn't think it would actually be at Parliament Hill. I thought it'd be like down the road and like yeah. a building. It wasn't actually like, we kind of invited you to Parliament Hill. But no, then we went through the security and the shield belt, and they gave us the tour and explained the voting process. And I, it's funny, because I went with the director, Brett, and I mean, we poke fun at the politicians and stuff a lot yeah. in there, right? And then we're interviewing in front of politicians. So Brett was like, well, if this goes sour, I'm going to just be behind the camera and say that I'm the camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, so if it doesn't go well, but if, I mean, they received it really well. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. I, oh, I have a whiz question, and it about back into culture. He's in a video, right, um, Goodwins? Because you kind of know. He wears a Mark Am free Mark Emery shirt. Really? Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Play the cars before you say you read for war. Be ready to take a loss. Bitch, I'm a boss. I'll be rolling up that good, nigga. I keep both hands clean. Might be my goons that's on the crime scene. Don't when they gang up when they approach. Don't even talk, man, because you know it's bigger. Ain't in first class because I'm the only nigga. What type of message does that bring out to, like, because he, he's, he's in the video is played everywhere. Well, that, I mean, that's what kind of I, I, Wiz talked about today is that, you know, thank you very much, is that um, that's a big reason why his, his music got so popular is because from the start, I mean, he built his career on YouTube and then got discovered and became big, but he was very open for, about his cannabis use from the beginning, and he's one of the only new age guys that connected well with, with the culture and being so open about it that, again, he got support from that cannabis army and you know has really brought him to the next level so he's very appreciative and he and he gets that and he comes from that new generation of the social media being such a key thing that he really really connects the two and sees that that's kind of where the social shift is starting to come from because that really connected like i you know hopefully people see the shirt and then look him up obviously um you know our exactly principal. in fact we, we try to get an interview with him for the follow-up but the prisons will not let us in no, the, the prison won't let you interview Mark. No. They probably watched the union. 
Pardon? Yeah, they will not. Li- we try, depending on if we're, you know, if we're go, if we're trying to interview someone that's really opposed to a lot of the information or some of the other people we're in, we try to dance around some of the other things so they, because we want to get an honest opinion from everybody, but a lot of people on, uh, you know, certain sides of the argument just do not want to sit down. So, so I, I, we didn't know, I didn't know that Mark, so what you're saying is that you tried, you applied to interview Mark Emery and the prison turned you down. Yeah, they will not let us go in there. That's We're hoping with the, because the petition got, you know, it was agreed to by the United States to transfer him up to Canada. So we're hoping when he comes up to Canada, we might be able to get him there. Because I think they might be a bit more lenient than the American prisons. But uh, I, I just talked to Jody a couple weeks ago and she just said, you won't be able to get him. So maybe you might want to interview me, but you won't be able to get him. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, because it would have been just a cool shot. It's cool to get that kind of footage, right, to go in prison and go in there and, and give everybody an update on what happened to him since the first film. And, but, yeah, unfortunately, we're, we're not able to get in there. Um, so that, I didn't know that. So that is ex- that, that's sad news, but it's excellent that we, we heard that news. So these are the things that people kind of want to they, – they, well, they want to see, right? They want to hear about, about yeah. what your next – well, that's kind of what the, the social media world's caused that, right? Is that you want to hear all these little things now, right? Like a lot of the artists and stuff that you follow. I know with me, I like the people that are actually doing their Twitter and social media and are yep. following, doing things. Like the ones that I can tell it's just like a publicist running for them, I stop following them. Where it's just motivational quotes every day and stuff like that. It's boring. Yeah, oh, for sure. And that's a question I have. In, what, what role has the internet played in ending prohibition? It's funny because that's a question we ask a lot of our interviewees. Oh, sorry about that. that. No, no. And is that a direct correlation with, you know, kind of uh, uh, the progress that's happened? It's definitely the Internet, I think, is the most vital tool. I think it's what's allowed him for The union would have – I'd have no career and the union would not have been a successful film if it wasn't for the Internet. We had no money to market. I'd already borrowed a quarter million dollars from my family and there was no more money for marketing. And all we did is we were able to advertise on social media sites such as Facebook. And then it became this big, had a huge cult following that nobody expected. And it shocked everybody from the distributors to everybody to how well it did. And it's kind of the new age what the internet allows for is it allows for the audience to tell mainstream what they want to see. And Kickstarter was just the icing on the cake to prove that point, right? Is that we kept going out to market and market kept saying, Nobody wants to see a pot film. There's no interest. Nobody cares. And we took it to Kickstarter and said, well, that's what they're telling us, but I think that that's not the case. And, you know, 3,500 people proved them drastically wrong that that is totally not the case. DJ Goodwin's in the back. Chris Goodwin, who does our audio board and mixing, he told me before coming on, because he was putting up all your videos. He's been rushing around. Yeah. And uh, thanks to him for getting us in here. And he's the brain trust of Vapor Central told me, he's like, Okay, I, I pledged 50 bucks for this movie. Yeah. Attaboy, thank you very much for the support. <laughs> yeah, man, no worries. So, yeah, he, we are excited to have you. It's, like as I said, your movie has really opened up eyes. I think it, it uh, you are on George Strombolopoulos. You've kind of caked indoors. And the question I have is, do you think people, I, I guess people thought you're an activist. Yeah, that's a, a common in, it, you know, it's one of those, and same when we interviewed Be Real from Cypress Hill, and he talked about, I make the comparisons, not that I'm, not that we're even close to as big as them, but he talked about when you make choices in your career, when they made their choices to come out and be very open about their cannabis use, it closed a lot of doors right away. And we were warned about even doing a documentary as unbiased as possible, like we did with the union, and go out there and tell it. Just because you're not telling the mainstream side, you're going to get a stigma and doors are going to close. And for a while, when I'd go into the film industry, nobody could see me and my crew as anything other than activists. They didn't look at us as filmmakers and they didn't look at us as anything else. And I was like, until I started doing some of the other docs, like I did I Am Bruce Lee and I just finished The Good Son. And then people were like, oh, he's actually a filmmaker. Like, yeah. And you, if you actually paid attention to the union, the to spot, to, you know, separate from the information, the film, as far as editing and the way it's shot, is done it's really excellent. well. It's an excellent documentary, and that's what you've been kind of tagged as the pot doc guy. And I don't mind that for the community. It's great, but when I went to market, I saw how there's such a stigma. I faced it, you know, working on a film because I just believed in telling the truth and doing something that was entertaining. I'm like, I'm all about the... I, I don't care. Like, Johnny Depp did a movie about a cocaine smuggler and blow, right? Like, it yeah. shouldn't matter 
what you do as long as the final product is good. So I went into it totally, you know, I, I was a rookie and I, I didn't know this, I didn't follow the marijuana movement, I didn't know the argument at all and I think that's why the union turned out so good is that we, we went in eyes wide shut, right? Not really knowing what was going on at all and totally had our world turn upside down and then we just presented that on screen in an entertaining way. So the, the culture high, you have major distribution. I'll be able to see it at the, like, the major movie theater here in town. Well, see, even when you have a theatrical distribution, because of the Internet, there are pros and cons, right? And one of the cons of the Internet is that we do have a theatrical distribution, but the theatrical won't be like Thor or anything like that. It'll go, you know, you don't get that kind of advertising dollars, right? Because those <laughs> movies, when they say their budget's $300 million, it's 200 for the movie and $100 million to market it, right? So the marketing can often cost more than the movie. And nobody will put that in any doc other than a Michael Moore or Morgan Spurlock doc. They just won't, especially not a cannabis doc. So it is getting a theatrical release, but we're doing it much more, much similar to Kevin Smith's release of Red State, where... Again, the audience can choose how wide the release goes. If they demand it in 100 cities and people are showing up, then it will go in 100 cities and it will screen in 100 different theaters. Um, it's going to be on demand for cities. So again, it's another way for the audience to directly show on top of wanting to support the film, but it can actually show people that they're, the public does care about this argument and that they're willing to go to the theater to show that they do care to see films about this kind of subject matter. I think you might also have a lot of pot people like lighting up those e pens. Oh well, that's all good too. No. <laughs> we lit up an e pen at we had uh, Naomi and I at the back there did five innings at the Rogers Center in the Jays game with the e pen, and the guy just came over and quietly asked us to put it away. Oh really? <laughs> that's oh that's nice. They didn't kick you. That's good. Yeah, See, those that's I mean that that's a dramatic change from only five six years ago when we did the union, right? That stuff was not happening. So it's and you're hearing that more and more. Unfortunately, you're hearing other states still kind of going the other way, which is. Well, uh, I had a court. Or I have a. Cor I had a court-ordered exemption, and I was at Young and Dundas Square, and I should have been able to smoke marijuana legally, and I ended up spending a night in jail for that one. So it, it's so just it's weird. It's a, we, I we need to w end prohibition, so we're not on the wrong side of the police, um, and that's a a big issue I have. Does it, good ones? Do you have any questions? I um, I talk about film festivals. Oh, here's a question. Is there something about moving slow that is dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> so somebody watched the film, obviously, that question, because that's that, uh, or, or there's that one comment in there, is there, is there something dangerous about moving slowly? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's just so good. Yeah, it was great. I mean, and we're doing streeters again in this, because it's always great to see, and, and that's where you really see, like, you know, to many people sitting in this room, a lot of the stats or what's going on right now seems like second knowledge, but... I'll tell you, we've done streeters in Boston, New York, and L.A. right now, and 95% of people don't have a fucking clue what's going on. You even ask them right now. The one that's surprising to me is we say, is marijuana legal, fully legal anywhere in the United States? And people are like, yep. I'm like, where? California. I'm like, really? Have you, you not seen the big votes that happen? There's only mm -hmm. two states that it is really. But it's funny. I think literally out of the 40 streeters we've done, one person has got that, that question correct. Well, I believe, I mean, even here, I mean, uh, people, I guess, subscribe to just the, the token part of SPOT and they don't become activists or advocates. Or it usually takes, for an activist, it takes um, to someone really become advocating. Advocating marijuana, they actually have to go through some sort of life-changing event, I feel, that um, makes them pretty, I'm going to fight for this plant and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Yeah, you, usually either, yeah, they have someone get sick in their family or they get on the wrong side of the law, right? And that's, uh, I mean, giving away spoilers here for the film, but... Excellent. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, that's what some of the law enforcement we interviewed is they can actually date back when the shift in law enforcement changed and it was when the drug war started because certain cops that we interviewed said when they started their career, when they go into a community... The community used to welcome them and come up to them and like want to see their badge and ask how it was to work the, the street. And then that same cop, by the end of his career, would go down the street and everybody closed their door and didn't want to have anything to do with them. It made a separation where it m look cops and society as us versus them, where really they should be part of the community, right? They are supposed to serve and protect. And 
But when you take a warlike attitude and you're wearing military grade boots and bulletproof vests, then of course it's going to further separate the genre. Or if you've seen somebody that was you know, doing a nonviolent crime affected by the drug war, then you don't want to help them, which hurt the police more than they thought because um, one of their biggest resources is information. And where they used to get that information was great detectives used to reach out to the community and right. say, hey, we had a girl disappear in this block. What's been different? Mm -hmm. You know what? And some of the, even the guys that were involved in low-level crimes would be like, well, you know what? There's this new camp opened up on the other side of the street, really shady people, crazy shit going down there. I think you should start there. And when that communication broke, that's one of the biggest resources detectives used to use uh -huh. because that, that whole thing of don't rat, don't snitch, that whole – that was all started because of the drug war because why wouldn't you want to rat on a pedophile or a child molester? I'd rat right away. Exactly. Um, is the budget for the culture high larger than of the union, and how will this affect its production? Yeah, From it's... Conic Cultivator in the chat. It's much larger. I mean, even the Kickstarter total, that's only a percentage. Kickstarter, after Amazon and Kickstarter and pledges didn't go through, we, we took 190000 out of that. And then my family and me have put in another 140, and then we have pre-sales of about 350,000 with Super Channel, Phase Four Films, Eagle Entertainment in Australia. Um, so the total budget's about 635, and the original budget of the union was about 350. So oh, double, double, yeah. And then what that helps us do is it allows us more shooting days, access to bigger interviewees, more archival footage, like all the black and white footage and stuff that we use that. You know, we got reviews that it was clever and it was a way to make fun of it, but it's because we couldn't afford anything else. We needed yep. something. It was free. It was free it was online free. archival footage, so we used it and graphics. It allows us a whole bunch of things. It allows us to put more money into music. It's allowing us to travel to Europe. We're doing an extensive trip to Europe. So on every level, it allows us to make a better film. And I've said this in other interviews, and that's something that I... like. I'm an open book with my budget. I'd love to just display it online and show people how much we make for making the film because trust me, I went back to my parents I'm borrowing another 140,000 for this film. So I was going to ask that. Are you actually do you when you talk about family, you just actually go cap in hand to mom and dad and you sit yeah, down at like the kitchen table. Like for the first film I borrowed $225,000 and my dad still wasn't been hasn't been reimbursed. I just Ouch. got it down to 85,000. And yet he still wants to give you more. Well, because the way I sold it to him is that puts me right back to what I borrowed originally. Oh. Right? So if you believe me the first time, I've gotten better since then. So let's just put that loan back up to what it was originally, and uh, I'll, I'll try to make it back to you on this one. If your dad wants to loan other people money, we could use a couple more vapor lounges <laughs> on our block. Uh, like, you really went cap in hand to him. Like, yeah. I, I, he just saw the passion that I had to try to make something good, and... I mean, any residuals that ever come in for the union, the first thing I do, I mean, I pay the general incorporation costs of my company and taxes, whatever else, and then I send my parents a check, and it's not that my dad needs the money, but I made a promise to my dad that this was a loan, and I will pay it back, so um, that's why as soon as it, it, it's probably my, some of my proudest moments of the film is that they believed in me when I set out to do this crazy idea to make a movie, uh, a documentary, which is the D word for death in the film industry, about a sensitive subject that sells in very limited markets, and I've been able to pay them back anything. Well, yeah, because one of the questions we were wondering is where your money originally came from the unions. So. Yeah, it was from from my stuff, and I mean, I put in, I had a little bit of inheritance there too, because my biological father had passed away the year before, so I put in a hundred grand, and then my dad put in two hundred and twenty-five. What's your experience in film one and? How do you – you've been in this a long time. Yeah, I started in New York. I went – I started in front of the camera first. I used to act and I went to if acting we school. We know what you act in. We checked. <laughs> do you want to tell people? Oh, what you, you guys busted. No, I think it's <laughs> we better. Bust, it, it sounds douchey if I say it, right? All right, all right. right. Okay, wow. what, did, what did you find? What did, what did Google – I'm trying to get all that off of Google. <laughs> trying to get it uh, – yeah, I don't think you're going to get it off the Internet Movie Database. Uh, oh, it comes oh, right up. I, yeah, there's I lots on there. there. A I soap opera star of some kind. Not a star, but I was on soap opera. <laughs> no, I was more, I'd call myself more of a soap opera box or like a plant in the back. I was an extra with maybe like one line here and there, like here's your towel or something like that. You were so like the red shirt in Star Trek. Yeah, 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 yeah. And something like that. Or I mean, I, the, my biggest part on the soap operas, I had a, a two-day part where I protected Susan Lucci's daughter. Wow. Because uh, she had witnessed a murder. 
but then I got killed too. So, uh, <laughs> you thought it maybe it might be your big break. No, yeah. I knew beforehand. It doesn't work like that. They give uh, you, they're like, Adam, we're booking you on a two day rate, thousand bucks a day for two days. So I knew where I was at. Yeah, because we couldn't, we were like, wow, maybe it's all that soap opera money you made. made oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, on, I, I think, uh, I mean, it, the film industry is kind of like, when compared to, I mean, only the top 5% are really making a lot of money. Right. And documentaries are not money makers. They're Still just living at home with mom and dad? I'm doing a little better than that. Okay. But it, it, the main reason why is not like my films have not garnered, garnered a lot of money. What, but I work for a production company that wants me to develop other feature films and stuff like, like that. Like the Bruce so Lee movie? Yeah, What's that was that a about? different company. Oh. Well, I and Bruce Lee really looked at... Um, you know, we went much deeper into the cultural aspects and stuff that Bruce Lee went through and kind of updated and looked at. He's often referred to as the godfather of mixed martial arts, right? And now with UFC being the fastest growing sport on the planet um, and Dana White, the president of that company, saying that he was one of the godfathers of mixed martial arts, there was a new angle to go on. So we, we did that. And I mean, I was a Bruce Lee fan as a kid, so it was an honor yep. to work on that with the Lee family. Hmm. Um, have you been? You know, one of the myths of why okay. they said Bruce Lee died was that he OD'd on hash, right? Really, I didn't mm -hmm. know. Did you know that good ones? I never heard that. That was one of the very many myths because he was one of the few athletes in his day. He was someone like before really being conscious of your diet and nutrition. For he was one of the few yeah. that did that. Like if you can remember in the seventies and eighties, you had martial artists that were fat. Yep. Right, and they're, they're senseis that were so badass that they never competed. Like, no, 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 they would just kill people if they fought for real, wow. right? Whereas you talk to MMA guys, and I'm f like Rory McDonald's from my hometown, and he's kind of like, really? He's like, you think I couldn't kill people if I wanted to? Like, I'm a trained fighter. I get in the ring, and I fight other trained killers. So those dojo guys that are like, oh, no, I'm too good to compete was what Bruce Lee was trying to prove was bullshit. Right? Ah. Was that all his training, but he's often criticized for that because he didn't compete much. He either well I, I don't know if this is gossipy but and we were talking about the ceiling i mean so you feel that you've sort of hit because you're the weedish guy how has that affected joe rogan or should we wait to try and get him on the show to ask him it'd be interesting because i, I talked about this when i was on this podcast and we've chatted about this where i think when people saw joe in the in the union they had never seen him like that before right they'd seen him as fear factor guy or host of the ufc a lot of people didn't even know he did stand-up comedy at that time, right? So I think when people, especially because he's in like the first 10 minutes, right, when he says he's like, I bought into it too. He's like, I didn't start smoking pot till I was 30. Yep. I realized when I was 30 I've been fucking tricked, right? <laughs> so he's like, you got to be fucking kidding me. So I think it was a great, and I mean now his podcast has become this global empire that, I mean, I am a oh, yeah. dedicated fan. I don't know if there's any Death Squad members out there, but Death Squad is yeah. often goes down to Puff Mamas. Yeah, Death yeah. Squad is so. always at Puff Mamas. All the Death Squad go through Puff Mamas. But I mean, I, again, Joe's been embraced by that community as well, right? He's he's found an army behind him, and that's why it was cool when I asked him. I mean, he, he's so cool. He's one of those. You can't say. I think he's one of the most interesting guys in Hollywood right now, and I think he's one of the most down to earth celebrities I've met. I mean, when he had me on the podcast, he showed the Kickstarter video, encouraged people to go there, and then I said, well, are you going to come back for the next one? Because everybody wants you back. You're the number one requested guy. And he's like, hell yeah, you don't even need to ask, man. It goes without saying. So it's uh, really cool to see that he's you know, willing to jump in. He gave me a huge, really helped the film. I couldn't picture it without him and you know, nice. helped my career in essence. Well, I think we're going to get one or question last one in. Sure. I, I don't know. I don't want to use up all your time. I don't. Oh no. Good. Good question. Right. I'm. I'm we'll keep. All right. Um. What do you think of Justin Trudeau's statements on taxing and regulating marijuana? You know what's interesting about the Trudeau shift right now is that that was all within the last year um, since we went to Parliament Hill. He was given a copy of my movie. There's a picture of him, literally about four months before he started coming out and saying this. So. A and Erwin Kotler, who invited us there, was under his father. Right. So, who was originally trying to push for decriminalization, uh, you know, back in, what was that, the 80s? So, oh, yeah. an interesting story with Erwin, because so I think it's kind of a full circle, because Erwin Kotler, when he originally was under, or sorry, he was under Kretchen. Yep. When they tried to push. And Erwin Kotler's own son was like, I can't believe 
that you are trying to push for decriminalization, Dad? Like, haven't you seen what it, his own son believed in the propaganda, and his dad's like, well, I just don't think the research is there. But whatever, Kretchen got out of power, and Erwin Kotler's bill got crushed. But Erwin Kotler's own son watched the union, and he was one of the biggest drivers of why we got invited to Parliament Hill, because when they reintroduced this new bill to come in, uh, the liberal, his son was like, he's like, oh, are you gonna be mad at me again? He's like, no, actually, I watched this movie, The Union, and it totally changed my perspective. You gotta watch it, and then Erwin Kotler's like, we keep getting letters about this movie, so you know what? We're just gonna invite this guy to Parliament Hill and finally meet the guy. Nice. That is, uh, you know, did, and yet... Erwin Kotler, for those who know, he's the current justice critic of the... Oh, no, he's the, the, he's the liberal, he's like third bench these days. Yeah, yeah, so you know... So yeah. he's... Yeah, Erwin Kotler, tell a story I can have is one of the reasons I really got passionate about marijuana is that Erwin Kotler's decrim bill under Cretchen is the only piece of Canadian legislation ever to be taken to the White House to be viewed before it hit the Parliament floor. It's the only time. And I remember Jack Layton standing up and demanding his reservation. He's like, you cannot, uh, you know, how can you dare go to Washington to meet with their... Department of Justice to, to show them country. the bill, <laughs> another country before you even brought the bill to our country. Like to me, that is a very treasonous uh, activity. So, um, a lot of people talking about um, Sanjay Gupta's documentary Weed. It's on yep. uh, CNN. Is that true, CNN? Yeah, it's a CNN produced doc, and it'll. I think it airs tomorrow. Yep, that's what they're talking about. Yep. No, I, I think it's great, and it's interesting that uh, some a lot of great clips for us to be able to put in the culture high, because we reached out to him for the first film, and he denied us, right? And he took the position that he did, and now he's coming out and saying, and, and the way he's saying it kind of relates back to what we were talking about, the internet, and how that's kind of changing a, a, a social consciousness, is that when they asked him what made you make this, he's like, well, I actually looked into the research, right? And actually right. found out that, shit, they were telling the truth, right? So it's, it's almost, I, him changing his stance is powerful, but him changing on why he did is almost more powerful because we made a little comment about that in the union, how a lot of politicians, we understand why they don't make the changes because God forbid they look at the person that was in before them because they don't want people to take a look at their work when they leave afterwards, right? right? So a lot of the time, and that's kind of what I got when I went to Parliament Hill, wasn't so much that it was some big conspiracy or anything that they weren't making moves to change laws. It was just that they didn't look into it because they didn't think it would help them win votes to get into cabinet. So they I just... I hate, I hate to break this one to you, but uh, Stephen Harper, even though the movie played on Parliament Hill, it's Stephen Harper still passed mandatory mins for yeah, marijuana yeah, growing yeah, yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, he's... He still he's lost that one despite our best efforts and even showing them a movie. Let's just play a movie. Because it's the easiest thing to do to some. Let's just play a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Put the lights down. Yeah. Um, so, Goodwin, do you have any questions you want to add? Anybody in the room? This has been. I was going to jump in on the Joe Rogan topic. Obviously, okay. I'm a huge fan of Rogan. Ari Shafir comes here all the time. A bunch of those guys. The Death Squad guys do go to Puff Mama's place a lot. But uh, have you seen his new show, uh, Joe Rogan Questions Everything? And then also as a secondary question have you seen uh, i heard you mentioning you know you have more money for graphics and funny but you know the first three episodes of his show is getting a lot of slack for sci-fi adding graphics and adding quick cuts and adding things that are maybe expensive but are kind of cheesy uh, see there's different ways of doing that it, it's uh uh with graphics and stuff when i mean that i mean more like the union, we used a lot of graphics, right? When we explained the breakdown of the union and we used a green screen and we made it orange and we did that, that's the kind of graphics I consider. So I'm definitely aware of Joe Rogan questions, everything. I haven't got to watch any of the episodes. It's actually kind of put a, a hinder on our, us doing an interview with Joe because he's been so busy that he's like, man, I'm swamped with the show. I don't have time to do it. But the graphics like that, I wouldn't say, would just allow us to kind of compete with what Michael Moore did in his documentaries and kind of the graphics and cartoons, that those kind of graphics. I mean, we're not gonna animate sci-fi creatures and have them do anything. It'll just be, when we do graphics, it's very sharp and clever. But the quick cuts, I mean, we did that in the union and actually at the time, we were one of the first documentaries and 
we get accredited from other documentary filmmakers. They're like, I want to steal your quick cuts. They're very YouTube-ish, which is the new culture that follows that kind of film, right? Very quick, quick cuts, attention changing quickly. I do Whereas that. Old document. Well, it, it's it's. I mean, that's there's science to show that that that's our culture. We're doing like when we used to watch videos on the internet five years ago. Five to ten minutes was okay. Now we look at that, we're like, fuck, it's over two minutes. Like, <laughs> if it's Actually, not like trailer room, length, we don't want to watch it, right? That's like, so that that was the editing that Brett was kind of. We were kind of. I don't want to say the first in the industry, but I'd argue if you looked at the big docs that came out before 2007 when we did, we were one of the first that was doing really really quick cuts like that. All right. Yeah, that's the other documentary filmmakers that are. M way more established than me have actually complimented that that's something they really like that we use the technique so long long answer short and for you is that the graphics we will be doing it in the right way in the way yeah. we do our film Sam do you have a question good to hear not yet give you a minute Ma mainly I uh, mainly would be probably going most of it would be used for archival footage because that shit is super expensive news footage and clips from movies and that stuff is hundred and fifty dollars a second what? So, yeah. 150. So, yeah, that's why you made quick cuts. Um, we can use two seconds of this. No, it's exactly. It's, it's like the Tommy, Chong, the Tommy Chong clips we had from Up in Smoke. That was $15,000 for, I think, we got two minutes. Ouch. Yes, it was painful. Tommy Chong's another guy who's often shown warrant wearing a Mark free Mark Emery shirt. Yeah, his shirts have gotten out there. Tommy's very old. Well, I mean, Tommy, as he said in the union, he became an activist after what happened to him, right? He wasn't before. He was just a comedian that didn't believe in the status quo. But then after they went after him for Operation Pipe Dreams or whatever, then that was what changed his view. Yep, uh, Tommy is pals with Jody and Mark, so that, you know you just never know. He just sometimes rolls in off the street, and you're like, "Who is that guy? Oh yep. my God, that kind of real stoner guy, <laughs> like real stoner guy." Um, I get uh, Brady here in the back. Do you have any questions? No, he's gonna. He's got. He's gonna. You asked the dab question, right? That was you, okay? Naomi. What? R.J. Nope, they're all just like happy with everything we talked about. Do you have anything? Well, I, yeah, I'd be bored as hell of me by now too. So yeah, do you have <laughs> last? Uh, wh how how to wrap it up? Tell people who you are and what uh, to expect from you. I uh, uh, just my my name is Adam Scorgi. I'm a documentary filmmaker. The Culture High we're hoping will premiere at. Uh, it's the sequel to the Union, the business behind Getting High. Uh, if you haven't seen it, download it on iTunes many times. I'm no, just kidding. Um, no, but seriously, once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the culture is coming out. We're hoping to premiere at South by Southwest if we get in, and then of wow. course have the release date in the theaters on April 20th in select theaters in Canada, the United States. Toronto will definitely be a big premiere. Can um, we throw the hosting party afterwards? Can I we host your party. I would love to just say yes and give that to you, but I have distributors that have some say in that. So we can invite all them too. We'll incorporate something. I will do my best. Look, we'll I get them high. We'll get we throw some of the best parties. Ever when it comes to weed, like we've like smoked a half pound joint on this stage, we've smoked a pound joint, we've given away a pound, we've given away five pounds at Young and Dundas Square. When it comes to like making sure our guests and throwing good parties, we tend to get people to make sure they forget like what <laughs> happened. They're like, I smoked a lot of weed, I have a pass, it must have been great. Yeah. Well, uh, it sounds like I said. I would, I would totally be open to that, and I'd love I mean, I, I came here on a dime when you tweeted me. I'd do my best to do that, but I, that is not entirely in my control. So I will do my best, though. But you have my contact information, so. Excellent. Well, here's the last. Th here's a great question. Chronic Cultivator is a big fan, you can tell. What can we expect from other production companies, and have we reached a critical mass of marijuana documentaries yet? I, I think you're getting there, and, and other, the one thing that, <laughs> we're giving away the the one thing that gives us a, a little Spoiler bit of alerts. <laughs> the one thing that gives us a little bit of a competitive advantage is uh, unlike CNNs or something like that is they are still adhered to corporate sponsorship, so they can only push it so far. And then also their style of documentary filmmaking is very, for lack of a uh, better word, boring. Right? <laughs> they don't make it like a movie because at the end of the day, that's what we're doing is we're making a movie, a 95 minute entertaining movie which is what got us the compliments at Parliament Hill 
And it's weird how I never really grasped this simple fact about why the union had been as successful as it has. It's because it was entertaining enough to allow you to retain the information that was presented in the film. Those quick cuts, those quick things to keep your attention going, was the same quick cuts that worked for the politicians and senators. As they, they all came in and they admitted to me afterwards saying, you know, we we're gonna watch five or 10 minutes of this thing and then sneak out, but we were genuinely interested into the film and even ones that had to go out came back to see the ending, which, I mean, in a political platform like Parliament Hill, those guys are there all day. They're there from 8 a.m. till sometimes 11 at night. Last thing they want to do is come watch a movie and then have to be there later. But it was because they all said it was super entertaining and allowed me to actually pay attention to the information being pertained. Well, it's the reason we've played it here all the time. <laughs> it is very entertaining flick. And thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh. This is the Myrna Wanna Zone, and this is Adam Scroge, The Culture High. In 2007, a small independent documentary unveiling the breakdown of marijuana prohibition entered the North American Film Festival circuit. The Union, the business behind getting high, would find itself accepted into 33 international film festivals in the span of a year. The film went on to win numerous awards and garner critical acclaim across the globe. With little to no support from big studios, the Union stormed the internet realm, reaching out to millions of viewers. Witnessing this overwhelming response, the filmmakers took it upon themselves to evolve the documentary from a simple motion picture into the beginnings of a movement. And so, the Union's social networking Facebook page was born, quickly growing to serve over 35,000 active users. Armed with groundbreaking numbers on what many had said to be a dead topic, distributors and broadcasters were forced to take notice. Five years after conception, the Union and the issue of cannabis prohibition was launched into the mainstream as the film was released into video stores, universities, and media outlets across the world. With newfound exposure, the film went on to claim the attention of Canada's highest level of government as it was chosen to be screened on Parliament Hill in order to educate senators and members of Parliament on the ramifications of marijuana prohibition. 
the rest is history. Now in the twilight of a public shift of awareness, the Union's makers have set into motion plans to create what they hope to be the most prolific and relevant marijuana documentary to date. The follow-up film to the Union, entitled The Culture High. Having had six years to grow, to adopt new stories, new heroes, new villains, and an entirely evolved insight into society and who we are as a human species, The Culture High will break down the boundaries that prevent marijuana prohibition from being stripped down to its very core. Are we least effective when lost in the emotion of group mentality? Has the emergence of the internet equalized the political playing field? The Culture High will raise the stakes with some of today's biggest celebrities, gain access to previously unattainable footage, and reveal incredibly moving testimonies from both sides of the spectrum. The Culture High is the documentary that will tear into the very fiber of the longest fought war of our time. But in order to make this documentary come to fruition, we need your support. By August 1st, we must raise $190,000 to kickstart the remaining funding necessary to produce this film. What we seek from you is not charity, but the pre-pledged support of your copy of the film. It's that simple. You pre-purchase your DVD copy of The Culture High for $35, and by doing so, you will give the film the ability to be made in the first place. The equation is, you pre-buy, the film gets made, you receive your DVD copy when it's finished. The level of theatrical release will be directly affected by the response to this video. The larger the response, the bigger the release. However, if this goal is not met and the money is not raised, you will not be charged and the documentary will never see the light of day. You have the power to put a film of purpose back in the public eye by letting distributors and broadcasters know that the demand to see a film of meaning and purpose is still alive, and that the importance of truth will never be denied. Very few times in this life are we afforded the ability to make such a difference in public awareness with the click of a mouse. This happens to be one of those times.